Uh, so for engineering ethics and social justice, um, we're going to be uh, covering first engineering ethics, and then uh, we're going to relate engineering ethics to social justice, in particular humanitarian engineering. These are the people that wrote the books that I'll be talking about. Um, Mike Martin's uh, up on the left. Um, this is the, the one of the this is the classic book really in the field um, with Roland Schindlinger and Mike Martin. Uh, then all these people are authors of um, this book, Engineering Ethics, um, and uh, which is probably these two books are the most popular engineering ethics books um, that are out there. I'll be covering ideas. Um, this is a synthesis of ideas um, from both. Um, and uh, first idea is professionalism. So historically, engineering has been very important to humanity, and engineering is a profession. Okay, we are not often perceived as a profession. Some people that are in professions like medicine or law say, "Oh, engineering is a profession." I thought you guys were just like technicians or something. Okay, so they don't really understand it. What does it mean to be a profession? It means a few things that I put in bold there um, when you read definitions of profession. Competence is, is, is first. Integrity and good conduct go hand in hand. And then service, okay? Now, we, this came up the other day when we were discussing the issue of service, and doctors and lawyers in particular had, as I mentioned the other day, um, pretty, they're strongly encouraged to do service to the community. Unpaid, voluntary, medical care, legal assistance, okay? This is not as strong in the engineering codes of ethics. And in some codes of ethics, it's not brought up at all. But it is there in uh, the code of ethics is the National Society of Professional Engineers. It is in their code. And uh, so a lot of people put service as part <coughs> of a profession. Okay, so the question I want to ask is, what does it mean to be a professional humanitarian engineer? Um, first concept, ethical dilemmas. How do you solve those dilemmas by making choices? And um, Do we get any guidelines from codes of ethics? So the normal approach to confronting a moral dilemma is this approach where you try to gain clarity on what's right and wrong in a dilemma, know the facts, Consider the options, use the so-called creative middle solution, and make a reasonable decision. And in uh, the book by um, Harris et al., they have this so-called line drawing method. Um, I'm not going to get into that. In the codes of ethics, there's the NSPE code, plus many others. All of your disciplines, your major uh, societies like ASME, ASCE, and da, 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 they all have their codes of ethics. You can look at them, okay? Um, and usually, though, they have a statement, something like in the bold at the bottom. This is the central, I call it sort of the central dictate of engineering ethics, and that is engineers must hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Now, we're going to be picking that statement apart today and in your homework. Um, next, moral frameworks. So when a moral framework is things like Utilitarianism, which means do the most good for the most people, or rights, or duty ethics, um, where you know, human rights or character is, is or virtue ethics, where character is you know, emphasized. There's self-realization ethics. There's the so-called community-oriented self-realization ethics. That's the set of ethics. So this is well-developed stuff, okay, by philosophers that is most relevant to humanitarian engineering in terms of community service. If you want to un study a secular, um, ethical underpinning for humanitarian engineering, that's the place to start right there, okay? Um, so you, you, you try to pursue self-realization and enrich the community. There's a lot of people that work for communities or with communities that get a lot out of it. I think a lot of people actually are in this field because they get a lot out of it. They don't have to explain why, it's just, it's fun, it's very fulfilling, okay? Um, then there's the area of aspirational ethics that, uh, that's relevant to humanitarian engineering where people will simply try to be an exemplary engineer, okay? Next, the idea of engineering as social experimentation is really pretty simple. I'm gonna pick on mechanical engineers uh, for the heck of it. So, mechanical engineers design an automobile and it goes out there and lots of people get killed, right? 
I mean, that happens all the time with automobiles. And they say, oh, crap, we, we screwed up the brake system. We could have done better. What do they do? They don't admit it. They're going to get the law after them. They fix it. Next year it comes out, they kill fewer people. Next year it comes out, they try to improve it further, and they kill more people. So they go back, oh, we screwed up that time. And it's this continual process of redesign. We're doing an experiment with our technologies, putting them out in the public, hurting people, hurting the environment, hurting health. And I use the example of killing because it's more gripping, but you get the point. And then we fix it. And this happens with, in every engineering, okay, across the board. Um, uh, it, we'll come back to the idea in a little bit when we start talking about the relevance to humanitarian engineering. Okay, next. Safety is central to engineering ethics, okay? Safety almost always costs money, okay? And requires competence. You have to be smart about putting a system together so that it's safe. Okay, safety matters a lot in humanitarian engineering. Water team, you better be thinking about this. Because look, if you screw up and make it more contaminated than what it started out as, or, <laughs> or claim that it's doing better than it is, clearly that's a problem. That is a safety problem, a very clear safety problem. Okay, those people that it's intended for matter just as much as your mother. Okay, get it right. I mean, this kind of stuff matters a lot. So you can't get absolute safety. That's absolutely impossible. Um, so the difficult questions come is, when is it acceptable to cut costs? And you cut costs, you get more sales, but then you injure or kill people. These kind of decisions have been made many times over history. Um, and or, or they find out about a problem. The classic one is they find out that people are getting killed and they don't fix it because it means having a recall on the automobile. Ignition switch, right? You thinking of that the last few years, yes. Have you ever heard of the Ford Pinto case? Yeah, oh yeah, I, yes. The Ford Pinto case is a classic example. There's tons of examples of engineers screwing up, okay, in order to save the company money, protect the company, etc. okay? Um, Next, engineers' rights and responsibilities. As engineers, we have rights, but we have responsibilities too. Professionalism in the workplace, it, it means competence, excitement, conduct, and commitment. It means teamwork and loyalty and collegiality, but it also means confidentiality. Uh, you know, trade secrets are allowed in a company. You don't go and, if you work forward, you don't just tell all your secrets to GM, right? That would be unethical of you. Okay, uh, and of course there's pl plenty of issues with conflicts of interest. One of the most fundamental things in engineering ethics though is the so-called right of professional conscience, which means moral autonomy. That means every engineer has a right to say what he or she thinks is right or wrong in an engineering setting. It can't be that the boss is like this on top of you saying you can't say what's right or wrong, or the culture you're living in in your engineering organization. Can't say that. If you think it's wrong, you bring it up, and you have a right to bring it up because you're a professional. You also have right to equal treatment, equal opportunity, not to be sexually harassed, um, and then there's a the whole issue of whistleblowing, which I'm sure um, you've heard about. Um, next, honesty. There's very high standards of honesty and truthfulness. If you're creating specifications on your project, you better make sure they're true. They have to be true on specs. For instance, for the water. You've got to say, okay, I think that the, the reduction in contaminants is this. And explain why technically, justify it. If you're not absolutely certain and you're more certain of giving a range, do it. But be honest however you specify, okay? Credit where credit's due, okay? So in other words, um, well, that comes up on team projects sometimes. If you're comfortable <laughs> on your teams, I, I would be fine if everyone... Uh, uh, signed and you wrote everybody's percentage contribution on the midterm. That's up to you guys if you want to do that, though. Um, <coughs> trustworthiness, of course. And, of course, the classic example that's easy to discuss in the university with respect to honesty is academic integrity and cheating. Okay? Over the last uh, two years, I've had 14 students cheat in my engineering ethics class. Take into academic misconduct and give it. Valerie's going like this. <laughs> yeah, I know. And usually a lot of people get a good laugh out of that. I find it absolutely depressing. Okay? 
Even when I tell them, this last year I only had one. I, I, I told them, carbon checks for overlap. Duh. Submit, same assignment. Anyway, environmental ethics. Technology impacts the environment, which impacts the health of humans. And if we're to hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public, of course we don't want to damage the environment, let alone all the furry little critters you don't want to hurt either, okay? Um, Self-interest of companies cannot be relied on to preserve the environment. Oh, I'm sorry, that's just the reality. History's shown that. We are going to, later in class, talk about sustainable engineering design, so-called life cycle design or end-to-end -end design. Um, I'll defer to later on that issue. Um, global issues, we're going to be, a number of these things will be later. We'll talk about technology transfer and appropriate technology. Um, there's a very tricky issue of when in Rome, do as the Romans. That's the old saying, right? And what they're usually referring to, though, is the overindulgence of the Romans, right? That's what they're, that statement's referring to. But in this context, what it means is, you're, let's say you're an engineer, you're working for big company X, you go to uh, uh, pick your country, developing country, and you develop a sweatshop. This is happening all the time, right? So, what environmental rules do you follow when you set up a sweatshop that's going to pollute? I mean, almost everything pollutes, so it's, it's a manufacturing facility, it's going to pollute. Do you use U.S. laws? Eh, not going to happen. Do you use their laws? If they have laws? They probably have laws, but they're not enforced. Is the typical pattern. So what do you do? They, you're moving over there in the first place to keep costs down, right? Well, you're keeping costs down because you can pollute. And you can abuse your workers. Easier. Fair wage. There's no minimum wage. Period. There's no minimum wage. Okay? So what's a fair wage? We discussed that um, earlier. Uh, and then what degree of safety is acceptable? Because you put people on a manufacturing line. I don't know if anybody here has worked on a, as a co-op on a manufacturing line, but you quickly learn about OSHA and the safety requirements. They're incredibly detailed. Okay? Do you think OSHA is over there? Uh-uh. Okay, so what do you do? Okay? Uh, another global issue is weapons development. We're not, I got some homework problems at the end of the book on that, but we're not going to get into it. It is relevant to this class because you could, some people would make an argument that... Um, Military um, intervention um, is humanitarian sometimes. You can think of cases. Um, but this is a very controversial issue, too. Um, about what, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, we're not going to go into all that, okay? I'd be happy, though, after class on Friday to have a, a discussion on that in detail. I mean, I'm prepared to do that because of studying it from my engineering ethics class, for instance. Okay, so let's switch. That's, that's the one credit hour course, 22 minutes, okay? Um, now, of course, in the, in the one credit hour class, we do tons of case studies to emphasize all the little nuances associated with each of those ideas. And that, that fills up the one credit hour class, really, okay? But I'm slightly exaggerating because I put social justice in my engineering ethics class, too. So some of this stuff is in my class. So <clears throat> here's the thing. I want to start by looking at the central dictate, the central mandate for an engineering ethics. So hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. So the question is, is are the publics different in humanitarian engineering? When these books are written, their public was basically the United States, okay? So does it change if my public is Honduras or Guatemala or Ghana, whatever? In, in um, many ways, of course not. Those people are just, more, just as important as in the United States, just as important as your mother, okay? So, or your father. But there are some differences, I think, um, and one of them has to do with this welfare issue, okay? So when they say welfare there, um, remember, going back to the start of class, definition of a humanitarian is someone that's concerned with or tries to help um, with improving human welfare, okay? Now, human welfare is um, defined in more detail by social justice. It's very close. It's like human welfare is like a subset of social justice. Okay? So uh, the question becomes, if your population is oppressed, 
has real low development, human development, a real low HDI, for instance, low income. What changes? What does the meaning of the word welfare change here in, in, in any way? Because you, you, you understand there could be a weighting on safety, health, and welfare. So the question is, 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 is anything different? Okay? So let's, let's try to analyze that. I'm going to go through all the key concepts from engineering ethics. I'm going to talk about their relevance to social justice and humanitarian engineering. The first one has to do with projection of professional image. Competence and conduct is the way to remember professionalism. Okay? You, as you take that trip to Ghana with, in, in, or wherever, I mean, you got to be a professional. I mean, you have to be a professional engineer. Um, you know, we, we may, in the context of professionalism, emphasize service to community more, but that doesn't mean you forget about competence and conduct, right? I mean, not at all. All right. So the reason for that is, is your competence and your conduct really impact the quality of service you'll provide. Okay. Um, so I want to just say this. I know you don't go into humanitarian engineering to avoid the central issue of technical competence development. I mean, that, that's very important. Um, so getting it right and how you go about it matter a lot. So let's, let's look at this fundamental ethical dictate in engineering. Here's a question I want to see if I could a show of hands. Uh, I give this survey question every year to my engineering ethics class. I want to see if the percentage is similar. Okay. So should we change hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public to hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public and encourage engineers to pay special attention to the least advantaged. So what I'm doing here is I'm emphasizing welfare and the tough problems. So NSPE, I'm taking this, this statement on NSP Code of Ethics. So should NSPE change from the top statement to the bottom statement? Vote. How many people say yes? Okay, how many people say no? Oh, interesting. I, you saw the percentage roughly. Uh, usually in my ethics classes, 10 to 12% say no. And the rest say yes. Now, of course, I spend a lot of time prepping them for this question before I get to it, like multiple hours of lecture. It's, it's a tricky question. I proposed this IEEE committee on their code of ethics years ago, about 10 years ago, and they rejected my request. Surprise. Okay. Inclusive moral frameworks and social justice. How does the emphasis on individuals, individuals, I should say individuals, in Western cultures change reasoning compared to some Eastern cultures where the group is emphasized? You'll, you'll see that throughout the, the, these books that I mentioned in the beginning. It's very individualistic. Um, I will say one thing that's quite interesting in Japan, I'm really amazed by this, I've, been, I've read about it in the papers and I heard it more in one place. They don't really have a concept of a professional. I mean, I mean, so they're like, it's hard to even get in a discussion about all of this stuff um, with them. They, they, they have a different way of thinking of the whole thing, apparently. Um, other people would say, that we have a pretty naive definition of welfare in all these codes of ethics. I mean, a bunch of old engineers sit around and create a code of ethics. What do you think you're going to get? You think it's going to be deep? It's going to be somewhat amateur. Now, of course, in some of these cases, they're getting people that they're getting some ethicists on board, but always, I don't know. Now, if you take somebody like a Marsha Sen and asked him to, to work on this and define welfare, I think things would come out different. I, mean, I, I, I don't know if he used that word in any, any of his books I've ever read. Um, I mean, you, you can go back, by the way, to this statement and say, should it say, hold paramount the safety, health, and social justice for the public? Right? Of course, who's defining social justice? Everybody's got their own definition, including me. So... Um, And then the problem comes down to is things like technology 
policy to transfer, like sweatshops, weapons development, reasoning. That's all really tough stuff. It's very hard to know how to reason through it and get definitive statements in a brief code of ethics. Next, special responsibilities for the social experimentation. So the problem here is, I think, um, is really quite significant. Because in the United States, for instance, when Ford and GM make a mistake, they're often, you know, found out, right? Like the recent thing with the ignition switch. And things get recalled and fixed. But if you're in a developing country, how's that going to happen? You know, you, you, you go to deploy something at, at uh, Montani de Luce in Honduras and it screws up. Do you think, I mean, are there going to be any repercussions for you? No. That's unfortunate. So how do we monitor the problems that are created by our technologies? And then how do we have a long, social experimentation implies a long, long-term commitment to a technology in a location. How are we going to ensure that? That's another problem. Next, with respect to safety risk and the local or global ethics and laws. So this is a big issue. Um, do you use local, local laws for health and environmental issues? Um, when the statements in the codes of ethics that we're, are sort of mandating what we should do say, you always do that. I mean, you, if I'm setting up the sweatshop in Honduras or whatever, you know, and I'm, I'm like, I could be violating the central mandates of an e engineering code of ethics in order to get things done. Um, so can you adhere to these ethical principles and be profitable? See, some people will say, you better not fix those sweatshops. Why? Well, then, you know, if you fix them, it's going to cost more money, and you're going to drive them out of business, and people won't have the jobs. Those people are, want those jobs. It's a stable source of income. It's a very important issue. You remember the problem with income variation, but if they're working in a sweatshop, they're getting you know, a consistent sort of pay most often, even if they're terrible, horrible conditions. Okay? Um, Okay, so what are our rights and responsibilities on a, a global scale? Oh, things that come up in my mind is can male engineers meet, mistreat women or minorities in a male-dominated or racist society? This is a complex issue. Uh, you know, there's sort of, it's, it's pretty amazing the, the number of problems that still exist um, here on campus. I've had women tell me for years, it's the same pattern of bad behavior from the men as students, okay? Just, and, it's, and a lot of it's not a lot, but you know, I've heard some really, I've heard bad stuff too. Um, you hear about the stuff at the workplace, it's all over. I've taught engineering ethics in El Salvador, and uh, there's different issues there, okay? So there, there's a lot of issues and mistreatments between engineers by themselves, okay? Um, second issue I'd like to discuss for just a minute. You do know that humanitarian engineering attracts women at higher rates than men. Um, what evidence do I have for that? The three trips that have run to Honduras, uh, one of them since 2005, there's been 198 student travelers and half of them have been women. But college engineering only has 20% women. So women are overrepresented in the field. This class, first time I ever taught an engineering class in 25 years. Last year, walk in, half women, half men. It's almost the same this year. So why? Can someone say? And you, <laughs> you gotta be a little bit bold, perhaps. Yes? I'll take a stab at it. Um, I actually did a study for an anthro class about why women enter STEM fields and why we don't get more women in STEM fields. And um, a lot of it is because they don't see the connection between how a science, technology, engineering, math degree actually helps them contribute to society. Yep. Um, and that was actually a, a pretty big like underlying current why a lot of them went into like biology to be a doctor or you know sociology to kind of social whatever whatever. Um, but the point though is that Humanitarian engineering, there's a very clear connection between engineering and helping yes. some population in some way. I, I think that's the central issue in my mind, right there. And I've asked quite a few women about this, and they give me this answer. I'm not just talking about women students. I'm talking about faculty, too. 
And there, there, there's a fantastic report um, that, does, that has that study in it. It's uh, um, by National Academy of Science, National Academy of Engineering. Huge, huge report. And it, 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 women are, uh, girls are picking often their STEM, um, choice of STEM in sixth grade. And they are, uh, it's because they want to help people or society is, is the typical um, statement. Now, men, of course, are doing that too, but it's disproportionately women that are doing that, is the point, right? I, I think that's really the point. That seems to be um, the answer, an answer that's supported quantitatively. Hasn't been disputed. Yes, it's not. I've never heard anyone dispute that. I've heard a man in a class like this raise his hand and say, yeah, but I care about people. Well, I'm not saying you don't care about people. I'm just saying women seem to care about people at a higher rate than men. I think that's what the studies are saying. And, and, and when I tell, you know, when you're able to have a frank discussion like over dinner with your family and your wife and things like this, my wife's like, duh. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like a lot of people when you say this, uh, and look at the evidence. The evidence is, is um, not just in these kind of studies, but look at in development. There's a huge emphasis on women. Why? Because the man gets the money and he goes and blows it on, you don't even want to say what. Okay? Whereas you give it to the woman, they're helping the family, the kids, they're helping the whole thing move forward. And that's why, you know, people get sick. That's why the whole microfinance movement, millions of people, millions of loans, is done on the backs of women. That's where it's at. So, Yeah, I, I, find, I find it fascinating, though, frankly. I th the other thing I find fascinating about is when I started teaching engineering ethics, they talked in the book about this issue of direct contact profession versus non-direct contact profession. And they said, well, your direct contact professions are doctors, you know, psychologists. You know what I'm saying, right? Female dominated. Uh, in many ways, the, the, the teacher thing. The doctor thing is becoming that way right now. I don't even know what the percentages are, but it's moving in that direction. Psychologist, my goodness, my wife's a psychologist. It's way dominant by women. It's like 90% or something. And then it said, engineers, non-direct contact profession. And I thought to myself, the first time I taught that in 91, I said, that's going to change. And here we are, 25 years later, and it is changing. I, think, I see this field as helping promote that change to make engineering a direct contact profession, just as much as social work, teaching, psychology, whatever. I think that's a fundamental difference. And hopefully, we'll continue to attract lots of women. Are there any other comments? Okay, honesty and tendencies toward dishonesties, uh, dishonesty, many of the issues are the same as in standard engineering. Um, <clears throat> there are issues about not engaging in corrupt behavior. Uh, corruption is viewed differently in other countries and it occurs at different rates. Um, sometimes, I, I heard of, I'm not going to name the country because there's someone in this room from that country, but of a professor uh, critiquing an engineering design project and saying, your budget's all wrong. Where's the 10% for corruption to pay bribes? You know, um, that's unimaginable here. That's unimaginable. But, of course, we have corruption here. Of course we do. But, but corruption issues um, can come up. Um, humanitarian engineering situations demand a lot of honesty. You know, if you're slightly wrong, admit it. Um, a number of years ago, I was in a developing country, and I, I, when I was speaking, I, I made a mistake. And I, I didn't even realize it. And I got a hand shot up, and I was like, and, and he explained, and I was like, you're right, I'm wrong. And somebody afterwards said to me, that was the most important thing you said in your whole talk. Uh, you're right, I'm wrong. Sorry. Because it, it, it makes you, puts you on someone else's level. If you're working with someone, <coughs> Honduras, wherever, uh, and you're wrong, you say so. You just, who cares? And try to get it right. And, and you'll be respected for it and show your humanity. So, uh, Next, environmental justice. We, we certainly need a broader and deeper treatment in engineering, standard engineering ethics. Um, 
We need to define the state of the polluted environment and then come up with uh, issues of, with respect to sustainability and decide whether it's more important than engineering humanitarian technologies. We're going to come back to this issue. Um, <clears throat> this might seem funny, but you realize there's a trade-off. You guys are all screwing up by helping these poor people get rich. You know why? Because when people get rich, they pollute. And if all those people get rich, this earth is gone. All right? In other words, you're going to hurt yourself. So we had better do it right, too. I mean, it, it needs to be in our culture that in humanitarian engineering, we're trying to get that piece right, too. Okay? Um, next, uh, there's a lack of deep treatment of global issues in the engineering ethics literature on social justice. You know, there's no, issue, there's no treatment of issues like technologies for fighting corruption, like my one past PhD student um, is working on in Colombia. Um, and who ESA knows really well. Um, or just encouraging political participation. Um, there's no issues on setting science and technology policy. We'll have a homework problem on that. It's a very complicated issue to set science and technology policy, and it matters a lot for a country. Okay. That's it. Okay, so what I want to do.